Oh dear. Hmm? Slap. Could we have everybody take their seats, please? We need to get started. supposed to introduce the Dean so the Dean should probably be here right before I do <laughs> oh there she is okay good <laughs> welcome to the University of Michigan School of Nursing Research Day for 2018 I'm Janine Holden and I have the privilege to serve as the Associate Dean for Research at the school and to have worked with the excellent Research Day team led by Dr. Laura Goltekin and staffed by Bethany Osborne. Laura's here. I don't know where Bethany is. She's wandering. Okay. Um, who planned this great program. And I want to also give voice to the other members of the committee. Marianne Rosenberg. Somewhere. Okay. Uh, Jesse Casita. Harang Gang. It's wrong here. Uh, Lynette Jones, Michelle Pardee, Mike Greenwich in communications, and Laura Cinco, who served as our student liaison. I think that's the first time we've had someone do that. That worked out well. It's an exciting time for research. We're discovering amazing things that improve health care for all. And research is everywhere if you look for it. For example, I recently read that research shows that women who carry more weight live longer than the men who mention it. <laughs> At least that's what it says on my refrigerator magnet. <laughs> um, so we have even more important science than that for you today. In addition to our innovative program on the science of teaching and learning, we have 36 posters from faculty, PhD and DNP students, and from our undergraduates, including our honors undergraduates. And I hope you'll take time to visit those posters during the breaks, they're over there, and engage with these students and faculty. It's a lot of fun. We also have <coughs> lying around some of our brochures on the state of research at the School of Nursing. If you haven't seen the brochure, I think you'll be impressed with the quality of the research our scientists are doing at the school. Um, and speaking of scientists, it's my pleasure to introduce Dean Patricia Hearn. Dean Hearn has been the Dean of the School of Nursing for almost two years now. She came to us from the University of Texas system where she was the Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation. Dean Hearn earned her BSN at the University of Florida and her PhD in Physiology at Johns Hopkins where she also did a postdoc in biomechanical engineering. She has a long history of research funding and a large number of awards for that funding. And her most recent work, if I, if I got this right, um, is on, I think, I think her history is on cerebral edema, stroke and cerebral edema and ischemia. And I think her most recent work has been to use both clinical and basic science approaches to look at gender differences in responses to ischemic brain injury and the role of sex hormones on this type of injury, which is a pretty timely stuff, since we all have some sort of sex hormones anyway. Okay, I have learned a few things about Dean Hearn in the past two years. I know that she is a strong supporter of science at all levels of education and a strong advocate for the School of Nursing. I know that she's jumped out of a plane and lived to tell about it. I know her favorite drink in college was scotch. And I know that she is wicked smart. Dean Hurt.
So I must have been here too long if those kinds of stories are already circulating. Either that or I haven't learned how to keep my mouth shut, which is probably true as well. Welcome all of you. This is a very special day. Um, our research day is treasured by all of us because it's a time for us to really stop and think about science and about why we're here and how we're going to advance the fields of healthcare. Um, the Browse Lecture, which we'll talk about in a minute, is also very special to us. This is the eighth, if I remember correctly, lectureship. And you'll hear in a minute about the very special individual that's going to give that lectureship. I'd like to go through some acknowledgments that are important, and I want you to bear with me because there are going to be several of them, and I'm going to be asking people to stand because it's not enough that we sit at these tables. We need to know each other's faces and know the contributions that we're making. Um, I think that Janine's already done an outstanding job acknowledging the planning committee, so I won't put them through that again. But if you enjoy today, then you want to go to those individuals and say thank you, because they're the ones that made it all happen. I'd like to thank a lot of the sponsors, certainly the Associate Dean for uh, Research and her office, um, the University of Michigan Health System, also known as Michigan Medicine. Dr. Kalarko is with us today, who has been our sponsor and our trusted colleague for many, many years. Um, the Row Chapter of Sigma Theta Tau International, which is a critically important piece of the science of nursing. I'd like to pause for just a minute to acknowledge all of our poster uh, presenters and our students. This is the most important piece, perhaps, of what we do today because it's about creating new knowledge. All the things that are on those posters, all the things that we didn't know before, which is really what this day is all about. May I ask the undergraduate honor students to please stand and remain standing. May I ask all the graduate students who are presenting here to stand? Thank you. And may I ask any faculty members who have posters and, and presentations here to stand? And we have a few. All of you that I have called, please rise. All of you, undergraduates, graduates, and faculty, please rise. Congratulations on what you've accomplished today, and kudos for the knowledge that you're bringing to us all. Thank you. Okay, I want to also talk about some other very special members of our community and what they're contributing to the community and how it rolls on to the next generations of acknowledgments for success. The first one I'd like to talk about is the Barbara and Michael Medvec Award. This is a Nursing Innovation Award that was created in 2014 by, Mike, by Barb and her husband, Mike. And as you know, innovation is something that's near and dear to my heart, and I do believe is the future of everything that we want to accomplish. So it's an award that we all treasure very greatly. It's an annual award, and it supports the development and application of innovations for nursing practice that can improve healthcare delivery, because that's really what we're all in this boat about together. The Medvec Nursing Innovation Award is competitive, and it's given to a graduate student at the School of Nursing. Before I acknowledge that, could I ask Dr. Medbeck to rise and for us to thank her for this. We appreciate it hugely. <laughs> Thanks, Barb. This year's Medvec Nursing Innovation Award goes to Suzanne Knight and nursing, her nursing colleagues, Dana Shannon, Julie Trinkle, Beth Van Trim, and Debbie Handenbrook. Handenbrook. Sorry, Debbie, I didn't get that right. For their uh, work with hospital to home care video conferencing to improve communication, coordination of care, and patient family engagement. And if we're able to do that, then we will have done landmark things, to say the least. Please join me in thanking both the Medvex and also in congratulating Suzanne and her colleagues on their work. Suzanne, would you stand? delightful and important. So let me say just a few words about a very special person who is the founder of this lectureship. And I believe that Suzanne Browse did this because she believes in the school, she believes in nursing, and she believes in how much we add to the future. Her career began in 1958 when she graduated with a BSN from this school. Education continued with a master's degree in educational psychology 
a master's degree in community health nursing, and the completion of a doctoral degree in nursing from Wayne State University. And since her dean from that school is here, we can both acknowledge how proudly we hold her. Dr. Rouse was involved in many facets of nursing throughout her career. She has held faculty positions at Michigan State University, the University of South Carolina, and the University of Louisville. And if you ask Suzanne about that, she'll get this slight little southern drawl in her voice as she talks about South Carolina and Louisville. I don't know where that came from from a Michigander, but it's beautiful to hear. Uh, she has had a very distinguished, distinguished career, and in 2000, she retired from this long career, but has not given up her active service in the community, and as you can see, she joins us today. Dr. Browse was inspired to create the Suzanne H. Browse Lectureship because, as a PhD, PhD student and faculty member, she recalls, the research days were some of our most interesting and valuable times, she commented. She also noted that in bringing in renowned experts, we can provide our students with access to the very latest research and help, help them prepare to become leaders in nursing, a very prescient idea and one that we honor today. Would you please stand, Suzanne, so we can thank you and acknowledge this lectureship. So the, th the next piece that I want to talk about is a bit lengthy, um, but it's the heart of what the lectureship is about today. We have a very distinguished scholar among our Mets, and we're very honored that she came to Ann Arbor to join us and to teach us something about her fascinating area of research. Marilyn Orman is the Thelma Inglis, Inglis um, Professor of Nursing and Director of Evaluation and Educational Research at Duke University uh, School of Nursing. She's had this professorship for a number of years. She is also many of the things that you would expect. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing. She is the editor-in-chief of Nurse Educator and the Journal of Nursing Care Quality. She received her BSN from Pennsylvania State University, her Master's of Nursing with a specialty in Education and med Surge Nursing, and PhD, where she majored in curriculum and in supervision. I mean, these are amazing things that she thought of to do those years that we need so much, even more so today than ever before. And that degree is from the University of Pittsburgh. She is the author and co-author of 21 books, more than 165 articles in peer-reviewed journals, and many editorials and other kinds of publications. I could list those books, but I think what would be more fun to us is to hear what came from those books and what she shares with us today. As I mentioned, she is a, um, a member of a number of very prestigious organizations, including the American Academy of Nursing and the National League for Nursing, the NLN. She received the NLN Award for Excellence in Nursing Education Research, the Sigma Theta Tau International Elizabeth Russell Belford Award for, the education, for Excellence in Education, the American Association of Colleges of Nursing Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Excellence Award, and I could keep going, and I could keep going. But I think instead of that, may I invite this wonderful woman to come and join us. Let me give her a small token of our regard and let me get on with what she'll do so well, which is to educate us. You should wait till I'm done in case I'm boring. <laughs> let me ask you to turn if you want. Okay. There we go. It's always one more. Thank you. We'll take care of that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and thank you for inviting me. And I'm actually getting to see people I know and former students because I did spend a lot of my career um, at Wayne State, and I've been able to go other places as well, but a lot of my career was here. And I want to thank Dean Hearn for a wonderful invitation, and it's been just great to speak with Suzanne Brass um, last night and today. I think asking a person who's done research in nursing education speaks so highly of the University of Michigan. So I have to say that initially, because those of us who have spent most of their career in 
R01 institutions that only count NIH funding, not even foundation, NIH is the best. It really says a lot about the understanding of University of Michigan that there's other types of scholarship that makes a difference in how students learn. So I really appreciate just that acknowledgement for nursing education as well. So they asked me to talk about my career. Now they didn't know how long it was on the phone because they couldn't see that white hair. And they told me I only had about 50 minutes. We would be here at least a month if I went through all those years I've been doing something with nursing ed, but I'm not gonna bore you with that. I'm gonna talk about my career looking and building some evidence that faculty can use to guide student teaching I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know about teacher preparation in nursing. We've gone through cycles sometimes, like when I did my PhD, there weren't a lot of PhD in nursing programs, so we studied other fields. Po nursing education was really popular, then it was really unpopular, but then there was this wonderful faculty shortage about five years ago, and people said, well, we better be preparing teachers again. So now we're on the upswing for a while. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to end with one slide on dissemination. Because I think you can build a career, it doesn't matter what your area of scholarship is, if you disseminate good work that's done rigorously, you can build a career. So I kind of want to end on that positive note. So I started by teaching clinical 100 years ago, and I realized students seemed really stressed in clinical. So early in my work, we looked at stressors that students experienced in the clinical field. And if you look at this slide, there were four areas identified. Truthfully, if I did this study today, it would probably be fairly similar to current practice. And somebody has recently published a study in nurse education today that found a lot of these same stressors. But back in the 90s, across ADN and BSN programs, students said they were stressed because they feared making a mistake. That's probably true today. They didn't have enough knowledge and skills when they went into that real clinical setting to feel competent to care for patients. Well, now we have SIMS, so I think we probably resolved a little bit of that. They were stressed when they had to interact with other people, managers, patients, and unfortunately, the clinical educator. And they were fearful and anxious during a time of evaluation. So thinking about those studies, then the question was, well, what about the faculty who teach the students? So I met somebody today who does clinical instruction. So we then embarked on a series of studies to look at were the faculty who worked with students also anxious and stressed? And if I was assigned to teach in a clinical setting, was that more stressful for me as the educator than the sim lab, which we didn't have back then, or um, a classroom? And we found that through a, a series of studies, clinical faculty were also stressed. They were stressed by having multiple demands, too heavy a workload, in these early studies, we found if you were tenure track, also teaching clinical, you had higher stress than non-tenure track faculty. I believe that's probably true today. They were stressed trying to balance the student needs with needs of staff <clears throat> and patients. They were stressed because they felt a need to be clinically competent. It's one of the indicators of a good clinical educator and effective teaching and they were stressed because of time demands. Now these studies we published in the late 90s, and I think I had one into 2000, and Robert Lovrick has recently done two studies. One was published in Nurse Educator and one in Journal of Professional Nursing, and guess what? He found of all the areas in which to teach in nursing, clinical teaching was still the most stressful. So some of this evidence in terms of thinking about teaching and nursing probably still stands pretty strong today. So what can we do about some of these stressors of students, some of these stressors that faculty um, face? Well, I think a lot of this can be mitigated with what I've called good clinical teaching. Teachers who are well prepared to help students learn in that environment that you can't control a lot of the variables. And we know what are factors that influence good teaching. Well, we know, number one, a faculty member in clinical 
who gives prompt, specific, and instructional feedback guides student learning better than faculty who do not. So it could be that's a principle as you think about working with students, helping them fill that gap in their learning, they're probably not as stressed then because of feeling of incompetence because the teacher's helping fill that gap in learning. And we also know from many studies that students who practice their skills, practice competencies, before they go to clinical, that they feel skilled themselves, they're more confident, and they have less stress. So building on some of that work then, um, I've moved into studies that have looked at what about practice of skills. And I'm going to share just two studies because these were big studies. Um, one was our CPR study we did in 2011 to about 2014, and then we have one we're just finishing. These were studies that looked at what kind of practice of CPR skill could we build into a nursing curriculum so students develop these skills and then maintain them over time? So we had known up to this point that CPR skills are one of the most rapidly deteriorating skills of all. We know that people get certified within a really short period of time. They can't perform those skills anymore. So we had that research. But nobody had said, or at least hadn't published, what happens if you take that skill and you build in some repetitive practice? Because we were beginning to see about 2011, people were begin to, beginning to do research on deliberate practice, which is a repetitive practice with feedback, immediate feedback built in to improve your skills. People were seeing for simulation, that was a way of helping people build skills. It probably would work for CPR, but nobody had really done that, which is amazing to me. You would have thought somebody else would have done that before. Niles et al. group in, the, in Boston, they tried one project where they took mannequins to the PICU, and at lunchtime they had staff practice their skills. 420 physicians and nurses practiced their skills, and the outcomes were people who practiced at lunchtime, the more practice they did, the better retention of skills. So that was enough for us to figure, if we could think about building a repetitive practice with feedback, would students and then eventually providers be able to maintain their skills? So our question was, would brief practice of CPR skills prevent decay? And so we examined students across 10 schools of nursing. They practiced six minutes a month, and then we looked at their skill retention at three, six, nine, and 12 months. We had 10 schools of nursing across the United States. This turned out to be a pretty complex study, not as much as the current one. And we randomized schools into two types of training. So some students received the traditional CPR training with an instructor present. They practiced their skills on a mannequin, whatever mannequin you, they were using for their American Heart Association BLS training. The other schools and then students were randomized into the American Heart Association Heart Code. And this is an online program. It had never been tested with students, but it really made sense because we do online instruction in nursing programs. So the other half was randomly assigned to do heart code in place of the traditional CPR training with an instructor. The heart code group, because it's an online program, once they passed, they then went to the simulation or skills lab in their schools and they practiced on recessa Annie mannequins. And this is what they looked like at the time. So that one group was traditional, what most people have. The other group was heart code online with mannequins. There were 606 students, and my hair was probably brown before I started this study, <laughs> spread across 10 schools, including some community colleges where there's not even an IRB. That's all I have to say. Um, so we had 606 students. They were randomly assigned. The second time, some were in an experimental group where they got certified in CPR. They then, every six, um, every month, they came and practiced in a real controlled lab with this mannequin under the site coordinator. 
versus a control group, and the control group is what the usual standard is. You get certified, you have two years, and hopefully nobody needs CPR in between because studies show you probably won't know how to do it if you're not in critical care or the ED or some other setting. Every three months then, we randomly selected students to come back for a reassessment of skills. Now, I consider this probably one of the really important studies I did because we found, actually because we used this mannequin that recorded all the data, we were able to document that when students mastered CPR and they passed certification, they lost the ability to compress between nine and 12 months. So we knew in two years when people came back, a lot of people really couldn't do CPR, but we didn't realize the key point was nine to 12 months. They lost the ability to ventilate after three months. Now I want you to keep that in mind because I'm gonna share our current study, lost the ability to ventilate um, after three months. But we also found if you have skill instruction, you know how to perform a skill, you had repetitive practice with immediate feedback, specific feedback, if you knew how to do it once, you could practice on a mannequin sufficiently to maintain your skill. And I want you to keep that in mind when I talk a little bit later about practice. So at an American Heart Association program, we heard somebody from the Air Force <laughs> presenting on a model that they used to train pilots. And this is a model that they call, it's actually designed, it's a cognitive model and it's called Predictive Performance Optimizer. And I have a couple slides in a minute, I'll share a little bit more. Um, and at that same time, the American Heart Association was shifting from this biennial cert recertification to more of a maintenance of competence, which says that once you master a skill, don't think you're gonna continue to retain that skill unless you practice it or really master it at a certain level, almost like an expert level. So this was all happening at one time and the Air Force presentation was, they had this model that they used with pilots and it was based on how well you performed your skill initially. They could predict how quickly that skill would decay and then when you would need refreshers. Well, that seems like that would work for CPR and a lot of nursing skills and medical skills as well. So we teamed up with the Air Force for our current study. It's funded by Lairdall and the American Heart Association. And we asked two questions. Does spacing of CPR training affect skill retention? And I'll show you what we mean by that in a second. And can this mathematical model that the Air Force used with pilot, PPO, predict when will CPR skills decay, similarly to what they do now with pilots. They come into the sim lab, they do their testing, the data from the initial performance of their piloting skills, whatever those are, are, are looked at into this model, this PPO model, and they can predict when you have to come back. So. We have a very complex study, which in retrospect, I should have never done. I probably shouldn't be saying that to an audience. It is very complex, and we also had 10 schools of nursing, including community colleges, without IRB, so you can imagine training people there to follow a protocol. Um, we had four types of training sessions, first of all, followed by four types of retention. So we don't really know what's the best way to train people on CPR. Should it be all at one time? Probably not. Would people master this skill better if they were trained maybe four days in a row to get mastery or once a week? So we randomized and developed four types of training. Students are assessed on their ability to compress and to ventilate because this model, PPO model, has a cognitive piece in between their practice of CPR, students get 15 Japanese words to memorize. And every time they come back, they have a quiz, how many of these do they remember? So do students retain their psychomotor skills and do they retain their cognitive in terms of these terms? The four training sessions are some students learn CPR by coming to the lab one time a day for four days in a row 
or you learn CPR once a week for four weeks, once a month for four months, or once a quarter. Each training session, students do three minutes of compressions and ventilation on the mannequin, which I'll show in a second. They do th without any feedback. That's the data that's used to see how much practice does the student need based on their initial skill performance. Then they get three minutes where they get feedback from the mannequin, then they take their little Japanese quiz, and then they get to practice one more time. We then randomize to look at skill retention for three months, six months, and then we have what we call a PPO group. And these are students randomly selected that don't have to come back at these times. The computer program tells them when to return. We have 450 students so far. And we have 10 schools of nursing again. They're scattered at different places of the United States. Uh, it's making it a little bit difficult. But this time, the, you know, the mannequins have really um, increased in sophistication. We're using the RQI simulation station. And it's, the data is automatically fed to a heart stream. So it's all you know, calculated data. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit what the take home is. You don't have to remember all this. The top is what we actually found. Okay, So don't look at the bottom right now. Just look at the top. The black is students who learn CPR once a day, four days in a row. The red is once a week, four weeks in a row, once a month, and then once a quarter. So here's the takeaway, but just look at the top now. The takeaway is when you come into that session, that 10-minute session total on CPR, you're going to walk out a few minutes later with better skill performance. That's a fact. It happened every single training. Number two, the more times you practice it, the better your skill will be. So those little squares get a little bit better as time goes on. Number three takeaway is the shorter the spacing of your practice, the better you retain your skills. So it is useless to learn CPR and never practice it again for six months. You might as well not even do it because this study confirmed what our other study showed, that the longer the time, the less skill retention. But here's the amazing thing. It's not my algorithm, so I can say this. The Air Force PPO model is on the bottom. So when they take our data and they overlay their model, it predicts how students will do across all the groups. I mean, it's really amazing, if I have to say so myself. I'm not on the Air Force side, so I can say that. Now here's an interesting slide. So I want you to look at the top. I want you to keep in mind the students, at least in all our 10 schools, you can't start your baccalaureate or AD program without being certified in BLS. So everybody was certified in the beginning, okay, before they stepped into the school of nursing. Look how poor their ability is to ventilate. So they're learning it in their CPR certification, but they're not retaining that skill at all. So we have the same sort of takeaway. You begin the session, at the end of your 10 minutes, you can ventilate better. You get a little bit better each time, but ventilation, we found in this study, is a skill that people are not learning correctly initially, and they're not retaining. But if you look at the bottom, the model, once again, predicted exactly what we found with students. So the PPO model looks to work for predicting student, I mean, or anybody, retention of a psychomotor skill and what kind of practice you would need over time. So my implications, we haven't analyzed all the data is that CPR is similar to other skills. You need deliberate practice. I think we're going to be able to report that this PPO model will work. I think it'll be adopted probably for people to learn um, CPR. My sense is if it's easy to use, it probably can be used for other skills that you have to know how to perform them, but you don't get a lot of practice in a clinical unit. So what I've called these kind of low-use, high-risk skills, if we could have a mannequin or some simulated practice where I could say to you in staff development, Dorothy, you've met it at this level, but because your performance was at 
this level, of, you should come back every two months to practice. This is just a wonderful study, so I should tell you, you can see we're excited about it. Well, we can't do all of our work in nursing education just to worry about the students because we have to prepare faculty as well. So I've done a number of studies where we've looked at, you know, who's preparing educators? So I should, this is on the slide, but this would be a good time to say, so many schools of nursing no longer prepare faculty. So kind of thinking about that and the last place I worked, we didn't even have a nursing education program or certificate. Where I am now, we do. But many, many doctoral programs do not prepare faculty anymore. If you take one course, it's, you're lucky. So we thinking about all this knowledge that we know in terms of best practices for teaching students, the question is, how are faculty, novice faculty, being prepared? So with funding from Robert Wood Johnson, they're evaluating innovations in nursing education program. We did a series of studies, um, and I'll preface, I'm only going to talk about two of them. We surveyed deans and directors of 253 community colleges across the U.S., 229 baccalaureate programs. And one of our areas, we looked at how much preparation new faculty had for teaching, and what do you think it was? Less than 10%. I think that's a problem. Because if you think about all this research, and you can help students learn better if you have some teaching knowledge as a faculty member or a clinical educator. To me, there's the gap that we need to be filling in schools of nursing. We also looked at what do faculty think if they're novice faculty going into, into schools to teach. And we found that the main challenges for beginning DMP faculty were building their own scholarship and teaching. We found actually the same variables that PhD faculty told us. You know, their main stressors and challenges as a new faculty member was actually the same, building their research and teaching. But the third variable for PhD prepared was really balancing their research and their teaching roles. We found that 85% of the schools of nursing had some sort of faculty development or mentoring for new faculty. It tended to be limited to orientation. But I've worked with new faculty, and really that short orientation is usually not enough. We found many schools had a traditional mentoring model where a senior faculty member was assigned to mentor a novice. But the issue with that model is not all senior faculty members are good mentors. I'm a senior one myself. I probably wouldn't be a good mentor for some aspects of some role. So that's a more traditional model. It may not work as effectively with current faculty who bring such a wealth of experience and differences to schools of nursing. We found there wasn't tailoring of mentoring, and we have a new article on nursing education perspectives where we really looked at maybe a better way in schools of nursing with this influx currently where people aren't prepared for teaching they were the way they were years ago. Maybe we need a longer mentoring program that's individualized where as a novice faculty, you're paired with somebody who can help you meet the gaps in your own experience. And we're recommending now probably a year. Um, and then again, we found faculty development was really brief. Now I've talked about some of the research that we've done, but I want to just kind of end and segue into a, just a different area of scholarship of teaching um, about, let's see, about four years ago, I published an article where I suggested that the Boyer model really doesn't fit nursing education because Boyer talked about four kinds of, of scholarship, but there was still an emphasis on the discovery or the you know, original research. Most of us who do nursing education scholarship, we have some original research but a lot of our scholarship doesn't fit in that area. And so I think we need to have a different way of looking at scholarship in nursing education. Yes, original research, but we do evaluation studies that contribute evidence that you can use to improve your teaching and student learning. 
We do systematic reviews, which are really popular now, but those systematic reviews produce new knowledge that can guide what you do in your teaching. And there's a lot of faculty who take someone else's research but use it to create new innovations and initiatives and study the outcomes that make a difference in student learning. So one of my takeaways for people here today who are do scholarship at teaching, I don't think we can look at it for nursing education that it's just original research. And I want you to kind of think about other areas of your scholarship that are making a difference or could make a difference um, other than just research. So that's my segue into my evaluation study on assessment. Michelle asked me about this. Um, in the nursing education literature, there's been recent reports of schools of nursing doing end of program high stakes assessment in the simulation lab. High stakes would be you have to pass that assessment to pass the unit, pass the module, pass the course, and in some programs to graduate from the nursing program. So very significant decisions. So seeing this coming in the literature, we decided to, and nobody's really studied how to do that. So we had a, a project that was funded by the National League for Nursing. It had three phases. A think tank was the initial phase where we really had people from nursing, medicine, um, and ed education, I can't remember where else, where we really talked about would simulation, should simulation be used for this purpose. Then we had a second phase where Pam Jeffries developed scenarios that could be used across any baccalaureate program in the U.S. They were, they were linked to the um, NCLEX and linked to more general outcomes of any baccalaureate program. They were, we validated them. And then we had a third phase where we tried to study, is this feasible? Should people be doing this in nursing education? And if we train faculty, will their scores even be reliable to see if we could come up with a standardized model for training um, faculty? So kind of the middle part of the study, we developed four, Pam Jeffries group developed four scenarios that could be used across any baccalaureate program. Three were used, uh, there were three variations of each. Two were used for training and one was used for our final field test. We hired students across all schools and we video recorded students and they had a certain camera they were supposed to use in a certain sim lab some of those had to be repeated many times, but we had video recordings of students. We selected the Creighton tool, which had a fair amount of reliability um, with it at the time. We added what we called a global rating score, where we asked the faculty doing the ratings of these videos, after we trained them, one question. Did the student meet the competencies based on the, the form that you were given. And we modified the Creighton because we had, it's a little bit too general. So we had the Creighton general areas and then we included some specific criteria for determining that that student was competent. Okay, so that's kind of an important factor. We selected um, 10 raters. They were all people who had simulation and clinical education as well as assessment experience. They were trained on the tool. They were trained on the process. They were taught what to look for when they evaluate the student in the video. So I want you to be thinking about what we do in clinical practice when the faculty or the clinical scholar might have eight students or nine students and there's all this busyness on a unit. We actually trained people. We had the tool. It was about, a, I think, about a 10-minute video to look at. We, um, the Raiders then scored six videos for training and nobody agreed on anything. They were wildly disparate. So we thought we had a little problem, we had a little retraining. Then we sent over eight weeks, we actually paid them at this point I think, we sent six to eight videos weekly for scoring, to keep up your assessment skills, to keep this tool and the competencies in mind. We then brought people together for two and a half days and we had them score 28 of our field test videos. We examined their inter-rater and intra-rater agreement and we found, first of all, two raters were wildly different from everybody else. 
Now, I really feel bad for the students who had those people in their schools. One person rated one video one level one time, and then like two months later had a completely opposite one. And another rater, not one student, met the competencies. Like, that would be the bad one to have in clinical. <laughs> so when we did the original intra rater, so how much, what's the consistency across the raters? When we kept everybody in, it was only 0.46, not even 50%. When we dropped those two people, and they don't know who they are, but when we dropped those two people, it went up to 65. That's, that's okay, but it's still not good enough. So I think this is my takeaway. This is not good enough if you are making important decisions when you're observing students perform in a simulation for high stakes. This, to me, is not good enough. When we looked at intra-rater, how consistent were they with themselves, it was a little bit better. But I don't think the consistency across faculty with how much training we did is high enough for schools to be doing this. I think it's very difficult to do, number one. I think the time and effort to develop and validate the scenario, to make sure you have the right tool and to train raters, you, we might do it at Duke and U of M, but if you think about all the different schools there are across the U.S., many of those schools do not have the resources to do this kind of training that should be done to make these important decisions. And then my last one is in italics. Some people may not be good at doing this type of rating. So, And if they're tenured, what are you going to do? <laughs> Um, and I just wanted to make one other comment. If you're using this in your school, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but I don't think a lot of people are ready to do it in their own school. So I mentioned when I had my own kind of model of the scholarship of teaching that another type of scholarship we do in nursing education are systematic reviews. These are really, really popular now. As an editor, I love them because other people read them and they cite them a lot in articles, so it's really good for the impact factor of the journal. I always try to publish one. Um, but they give you valuable information. So some of you who don't do original research, we're not going to get R01 funding, for the most part, for nursing education studies. But there's all this other types of scholarship that if it's good, rigorous scholarship that you disseminate, it will make a difference in how we teach nursing students. So this is my segue into the end of the semester. So we're getting ready to do our student evaluations of teaching. Um, probably you are as well. So last year, we had a large team, and we reviewed the research on student evaluations of teaching. We reviewed higher education as one set. We reviewed medical education as a second. We reviewed nursing education as a third, and we're ahead of medical education. So we had a lot more studies. We searched three databases, PubMed, CINAHL, and ERIC. And to me, these findings guide what items should be on your tool and everybody's tool in a school of nursing. They guide what faculty do when they get the ratings back. So the students in the room, be careful what you write. Think about this. There's take home for students as well, because these ratings are important for faculty as well, not just faculty development, but our own evaluations. Um, and so this research, this systematic review, provides really good evidence, I think, for faculty, for administrators, and for how schools design their system. So here's what we found. This, these variables do not relate to how a student will rate the course or teacher at the end of a semester. Age doesn't matter. I'm in luck. It's a good thing. Gender doesn't matter. Race, personality doesn't matter. If you're in a school where some people say, oh, those researchers, they're lousy teachers. Nope, doesn't matter. It's not, it, nothing in, relates to those variables um, in the research. Student age, gender, level, or GPA had no relationship to what the, what the ratings would be on course and teacher evaluation. And if you're assigned to teach Pathophys Friday at 3.30, it probably isn't going to affect the ratings as a variable, so time of day didn't either. But here's what did. So raise your hand if you're a faculty member. 
Okay, so to me, these slides are really important because they provide evidence when you read your own ratings from students. Number one rating was enthusiasm. It was across higher education, medicine, and the few studies done in nursing. The enthusiasm of the instructor was the number one factor that influenced student ratings. So I tell people, if you don't know the content, be enthusiastic as presenting it, because you <laughs> may, students may not know. So. And motivation to take the course was highly um, significant. In your school of nursing, if you have elective courses, you want to try to teach those as a faculty, because consistent across the research, elective courses tend to be rated higher. So if you're teaching those beginning courses in the junior year, and they're large courses, ratings tend to be lower. So um, a higher level course, graduate courses rated higher just as a, a group of courses. Courses in the beginning of a program that are large sections, I always feel bad now for these foundation. We, ours is now wellness, it has like 125 people and it's the first course. Well now I know those ratings will probably be lower just by nature of the course. Students give higher ratings to courses that they said they really worked hard in was a difficult course. Those courses tend to be rated higher. We know from studies that if your course enrollment is small, it will significantly affect interpretation. Now, all of us who teach small sections, or I have 20 students but only 10 fill out the forms, we know that influences interpretation. But I think this is an important finding because some of the research suggests those small enrollment courses don't lend themselves to rating forms and probably need some other way of evaluating the course. Pal did studies where she took their, their, rating, their student evaluation form and she had focus groups of students in their school of nursing. They had just revised the form, they piloted it, and then she asked students to tell them what each of the items mean and guess what? Students didn't interpret this form the same way faculty did. So my takeaway is somebody in a school needs to be taking the evaluation forms and the items and doing testing with students. How are students interpreting the way, you know, feedback that's prompt? What does that mean to students? We have one on enthusiasm. Now I'm thinking the standard for enthusiasm probably differs across student groups. But that we know from research. And then one other, what I think is really important finding, there's a whole body of studies that have been done on how should faculty interpret the narrative comments of students. So first of all, we've actually developed a new form based on this. Our prior form had about 10 different items that students would answer. And then with each item, we would have additional comments, additional comments. And they were brutal if the students didn't like the course. Well, the research suggests that should not be done because the comments from students tend not then to be focused on course improvements. So actually the research suggests you should have just two open-ended comments at the end and they should be focused. So for example, what aspect of this course facilitated your learning? So that's a, kind of an implication, I think, as well. And there's a fair amount of studies that give suggestions to faculty when looking at the narrative comments. For example, to, to group your course evals where you have the highest group on one pile and then the lowest group in the other pile, and then you look at student comments. Because it may make a difference when students complain about an assignment if they rated the course high or low overall. So I'm going to end with kind of my takeaway for anybody in this room that wants to do scholarship of teaching or nursing education research or any type of research. It cannot be done without dissemination. So you heard it here. There are 690 some journals. There's a in nursing tagged in Sentinel. There's a journal for every single idea you have in this room. You can't build your own career as a scholar without dissemination. So it's important for the faculty or student thinking about their career later in nursing 
you have to disseminate, but it can't be disseminated if it wasn't a good project to start with. Number two, there's a lot of work that goes on in nursing education that isn't disseminated, but people could use in other schools. So one of the variables that I see doing this for so many years is that I will go to school and I'll think, this is just a great project that you're doing. Well, we just tried to do it and it didn't work. It would have been better had I read about this innovation with some evaluation data so I could build on that in my own school. Faculty who want to do studies need to be replicating studies in the literature. So in contrast to clinical pra practice studies that we, that we replicate to build evidence-based practice, in nursing education, most of our studies are a one or a two-time study. It makes absolutely no sense. It would be better if you're thinking of a study on X innovation or some aspect of your course to replicate what somebody else had done so we can build our understanding of how it differs based on schools and students. For faculty, turn your work that you do for teaching into scholarship. There are seven nursing education journals. Most of the clinical journals publish educational topics. So it, we have venues for you to disseminate your work. And then lastly, don't do your educational project and then say, wow, this really worked well, or we should have saved all this literature. Think about your publications at the beginning. So when you do your lit review, you do it based on Prisma or some other standard that you can then disseminate, and you have a validated tool, and you save and collect the information to be disseminated at the end. Now I have time for questions. And I have no idea what my time is. I think I'm pretty good on time. Chake. But if you say it, I'll repeat it. Understand to be the traditional, <coughs> thank you, research, and uh, <coughs> then there is application. There is scholarship of teaching, scholarship of application, and then I think there is synthesis or something. So. <coughs> addresses a field that has a strong applied element, like nursing or You talk about why you find uh, the idea not applicable to our field. I probably should have said that, see, people are actually listening. It's like a bad thing sometimes. No, but I think Shaquet's point is that the problem, if you read all of Boyer's work, so if you actually read, when he talks about those other areas, He's really talking about more of an original research to build the evidence, an original research that builds the scholarship of teaching. There's, if, if you look at his writings about that, you really have more of that discovery language through all. So another way we could think about when I had my list of the scholarship, I'd like to build on um, Boyer's work. So if you're comfortable with Boyer, I'd like to add to that and say that development of educational innovations that then are evaluated is a type of scholarship of teaching and learning for us in nursing, because we do a lot of educational innovations. Building evaluation into a course that then you have some rigorous evaluation with a validated tool that then you disseminate is another form of scholarship. So I think another way to look at it would be building on his model. Talk loud. Michigan for three years, and we grapple about, uh, you know, interpreting them. Um, from what I know, I look at the literature, there's no 
publication about instrument development or psychometric testing of what we use, uh, maybe at Michigan or throughout the country. So based on what you presented here, the data, I think it's pretty much, um, I think it's an expected data in my opinion. Um, so I just want, um, I think I wanna ask your opinion about, about your thoughts about for us in the tenure track faculty, because usually that's the basis for promotion and tenure. And we are basing somewhat that it's not valid. So the, the studies, a lot of studies have been, well, the, the research is clear that the tools that you use in any school should be verified. They should be validated, they should be re reliable, there should be some tests done. I don't think anybody does that, and I shouldn't say anybody. A lot of schools don't do that. I've never worked in a school that we've actually done that. Now we, now we did for this last one because we had just realized how critical it is. So we've done validation studies, we've done reliability studies for our current tool. That's probably unusual, but it is consistent in the literature, number one. I think the implications for tenure track faculty or any faculty is, you need to know what the variables are that affect student ratings. Because when I work with a faculty member who's teaching that beginning course and maybe the evaluations are so low, I can say to that person, this is the kind of course that tends to be rated lower. Or we have a course this term in the master's program where the students didn't get their clinical placements till really late in the semester. I'm going to predict that those evaluations will be low. But that's a variable that we know about. And so I will tell that faculty member, when you submit your materials to, for your next level review, to put a note that this course, this semester, had this occurrence with students that might influence. Um, and I think any, even if you're not gonna verify your tool, I think some focus groups with students, just asking them, what does this item on your tool mean to you? And even just tweaking it, might be helpful to build student understanding. We found most forms have less than 10 items. So if you have a really long form, you might shave some of those off. That would be consistent as well. So I don't know, did I answer that? Mm -hmm. So I get the mic, so maybe I get the next one and then we'll send it down your way. Um, wonderful talk, great ideas. Let's go back to CPR for a minute and the concept of learning while under stress. And I think we know that learning can be enhanced with mild conditions of stress and that at high levels of stress it can be blocked. What do you know about CPR and teaching and retention from those who have actually had to use CPR on human beings in real situations? Do we learn differently? Do we retain differently than those who have never had that opportunity? Yeah, that I don't know. I mean, there's probably some research, but that I don't know. I think it's a good question, I'm, I'm not sure. So once the research is done and the evidence is clear, how do you get people to change practice? <laughs> Not well, just <laughs> I, I might be in Hawaii if I had that answer. <laughs> so, Especially um, clinically. Yeah. Well, you need a champion. I mean, really. Well, first, I think you need two things. One, and I know the dean and I talked about this earlier. One of the things I found among faculty is people don't go to the literature in nursing education to really inform themselves. And I've worked in a lot of schools in a lot of different positions. I have never worked in a school where somebody has said, well, I think we want to add this technique in our teaching or we want to change the course some way. And then another person says, well, let's go to the literature and see what research is being done. We go to the literature to update the substantive content of a course. So what we're teaching about our exemplar for cardiac is up to date, but we don't tend to do that for teaching approaches for assessment. So changing faculty behaviors is one, because that would save faculty a lot of time. Because you might find a couple articles and think, they, this really did work, there was no significant finding. Or not doing a post-conference in clinical and doing it online at the end of the week, five studies have been done, they all show the same thing, that might be a good technique to try. So first is really changing faculty behaviors. How do we do that? We need a course coordinator or a lead faculty, whatever you call them here, that has that mindset. Um, and I think you probably need a champion, somebody in your teaching group that will always be asking, is there a better way? 
The students didn't like this assignment. Well, why? Did they not like it, but it still improved their learning? How can we find that out? So just somebody who's always going to keep the education in their kind of mindset when they're making course decisions. Lori, talk really loud. Yeah, so that was a, so, you know, did everybody hear Lori? So, well, it was about really the, I'll just narrow it to one sentence. I apologize if it wasn't. But just actually, how can you prepare PhD faculty or DMP faculty? They can't really get one more area of preparation in their programs. How do you do it once they start? Everybody has a half an hour once a month or an hour to have a teaching conversation. Every single person. Serve lunch. Map out what are the critical components for teaching in your school that you really have to know about to be effective. One hour lunch, everybody can fit in. And plan it out ahead of time. Make it a year. Don't think about that one month orientation. There's way too many things to do. Plan it out for a year. Plan out the content and the competencies. You know, what are the really important skills that you need to do to be an effective teacher in your school? Map it out and have it as a teaching conversation or a, a small group and just do it that way. So we now have, starting this current year, we have a teaching mentor that now you have to work with for a year. We have a research or a scholarship mentor and now we have a culture guide just like a person who is for any other questions you have about the school. But if you are the teaching mentor, you are obligated, I don't know everybody does, but you're supposed to meet with your new faculty once a month. And there's more planned discussion. That's easy to do. So I think that can be done in a school that you don't have a lot of time and people are tenure track. So I don't know if that helped. You won't even have to do it a year. You could do it a half a year. Hi, Dr. Orman. Nice to see you again. Yep. Um, the question is about set scores and how we collect the data. So we've gone to electronic set scores, and it's abysmal. <laughs> I don't understand when students like technology that if we hand them a piece of paper, they do a better job. And so I'm trying to understand. I can't find it in the literature. Have you come across, because we're getting less than 30% of the students giving feedback. OK, but that's about norm. So less than 30%. OK, so in this literature review, what we know is schools that have studied the return rates for paper and pencil to online, they're always lower online. That's a fact. N tons of studies. About 30% is good, number one. <laughs> number two, yeah, it shouldn't be. But, but what strategies have people tried that work? So we have, we've reviewed um, the research on incentives. So one type of incentive is a non-grade incentive, and that would be an incentive that the course evaluations are going to open in two weeks, and the faculty tell the students, in two weeks, look for this email from whoever sends it out in your school for the course evaluations and adding the rationale. You're going into nursing. I expect everybody to do their course evaluations now. But you're going into nursing. Evaluation is important for your professional development. Add in why it's important to faculty and how it's used in the school to make a difference. Add that in. 
That's a non-grade incentive. Studies show that it does work, send reminders, multiple reminders for students, but what works better are what um, been labeled grade incentives. And these are extra credit points that students get if a certain percentage of the cohort answer, I mean, completes their evaluation. So they're completely anonymous, but it would be that if 80%, excuse me, if 80% of the students complete their course evaluations by like the last, second to last week, every student in the class gets one point on some predetermined grade, like it could be the grade of an exam, it could be a grade on the final exam. If 90% of the cohort answer it, they might get two points. Of all the incentives, grade incentives are most effective. Now, the study's been reported, and I can't, I think I knew the studies for non-nursing course, I can't remember, but the, there's been two studies reported in nursing, and both studies found, now the students should close their ears, but adding one or two points does not have a statistically significant impact on the grade for the course, but it's enough to motivate people to fill out the evaluation at the end of the semester. See, so now it's not gonna work because all these students were here. Um, we just pulled, we had one fac, we had one instructor who had always done great incentives before we even talked about this, and she hated to tell anybody because she didn't know how it would be taken. So we pulled her grades prior to using the incentive, one or two points, and currently with the incentives, and her evaluation completion went, went from like 30 or 40 percent to 90 to 100. Not one student had a significantly higher grade at the end. It was just enough motivation for students in case they needed those two points, just in case. So grade incentives seem to work, and that has been, there's a couple evidence reviews that have actually come to those conclusions. Mm -hmm. Janine? Well, I meant like a replication in another school with a different student group. Yes, that would be easier to get. Because if you do a study at U of M or I do it at Duke, our student population is not the same as if it's a student population from a community college in a rural area. It's a different student population. But if we only do one study here, one study where I am, one study at some community college, you, don't, you can't build evidence to see this teaching approach is really worth doing because we've shown its efficacy across different student groups and settings. You don't see that much in nursing education. Actually, it's really unusual in nursing education. And at the study I said about the post-conference, so there's like a growing number of studies where faculty have stopped doing clinical post-conferences face-to-face and they've moved to online, and the last three studies were kind of the same methodology that I actually feel better now to say to you, there are five studies, three were done exactly the same, but different clinical type uh, models, and in all cases, the faculty found higher problem solving, more student participation, and more participation across the group if it was done outside of a clinical setting. So that's what I was thinking. Okay, okay other questions? Mm -hmm. Linda? I'm just curious how <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a really good question about that. Actually, there was an article published not too long ago where somebody suggested we should have a certification for CPR. Like every unit should have a couple people every shift who are skilled and forget everybody else. 
actually in our study, this last study was students, the PPO, that was the individualized group. So those were students where the algorithm would say, your skill was so poor to start with, you better come back like every three weeks. We had to put a time point at the end. We had some students who came back 10 times and they still couldn't compress and ventilate correctly. Now, they don't know, they don't know the, none of the students know, but I think those are students who probably shouldn't be eventually certified in, C, in BLS because they probably don't have the skill. But they might be on that unit that day I have a heart attack, so. <laughs> okay, I think this is going. Oh, hi, Dr. Auerman. Um, I am, my name is Meg Sherwinski. I'm a PhD student here. And I'm, um, my dissertation is on nursing education topics. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, but as mentioned before, I do have some worries about getting tenure eventually because of um, the implications about original research versus education research. And we talked about student incentives. And so I'm wondering if you have sort of advocacy that you do about changing faculty incentives and how we, um, how we uh, reward publications versus teaching accolades or um, other things like that. And then also how you think that relates to this broader notion of how we communicate our science because um, I feel like education is the first step to like good science communication, which is so important right now. So two so, questions. Um, you can't be a scholar without dissemination, and you need something rigorous to disseminate. I don't think teaching is as important as your scholarship. I mean, I hate to say this, I'll probably be stricken right now, but to be a scholar or a researcher, regardless of your track, you have to have something to disseminate. It has to be original research, it can be an evidence review, it can be an innovation that you have studied, it has to be disseminated. I think that is more important than good teaching. Now you want to also be a good teacher and use all these principles, but I don't think teaching, thinking about how we define good research and a scholar and a scientist can be more important than having that science as well. So I, I think that was your first question. And peer review articles are here to stay. Um, blogs, they're important, but they're not peer reviewed. So that means that nobody's, for the most part, nobody's really giving the critique about that um, writing. So I think it is always gonna be peer reviewed. In some fields, it's books, chapters, but in nursing and biomedical, it's peer reviewed in decent journals. And I don't think that's going to change. And it shouldn't change. Yeah, so I think, you know, at the APT level, you know, the criteria that are written for, you know, reviewing faculty, I think have to be broad enough that they incorporate all types of scholarship. Great, thank you. We're actually going to cut off questions right now. Um, Dr. Orman will be back at our panel at the end. Okay. And we'll have the opportunity to ask additional questions to her and to the rest of our panelists. So. Thank you. Thank you.